Hello and welcome back in the waters. Let's start some. Oh, we have it already. Okay, we shall sure stay. Really curious. Let's show. Sure. I had those before. Bedrooms are feathery, slow moving creatures that live among the pillow garden flora. Their upper part is mainly composed of densely packed, fern like arms. Underneath is a body resting on a dense profusion of, sh of short, fruit like legs that anchor the gardener but also enable it to walk, albeit very slowly. As gardeners move, they also rhythmically wave their arms, though it is unclear if this is for balance or is part of their pruning action within the petal gardens they inhabit. Gardeners don't do anything fast, but they do travel between pillars using the silken tendrils that grow between them. More analysis is needed to discover why and why their relationship to this garden really is. Analysis of the gardener's feather, which I have called Pew, has revealed the gardener's feet on the same thing they can refer themselves as the garden's petals. The gardener feather pinnules a razor like edge with which the gardener cuts away a thin section of petal to feed on damaging the plant. However, unlike an actual feather, they contain nerves, suggesting the gardener can deliberately control them. For precise pruning and for monitoring in the water if they become dislodged from a tendril bridge. Quite why they risk such journeys, given their ineffective swimming, remains to be seen. Further study may unlock the puzzle of their purpose within the biome. Analysis of a gardener's arm, filled with pinules, has shed some light on the relationship between them and the pillar gardens. The debris coating the sand pool is actually pollen from various garden species, suggesting that gardeners are an important part of the cross-pollination process. This means their contribution to the ecosystem is not just limited to pruning the blooms, they help propagate them too. Indeed, given their roaming paths from pillar to pillar, they must have some way of accumulating communicating and ensuring that no one garden become wilted or overgrown. This could be a new social hive structure or territorial signature they leave behind. Either way, they are a well-coordinated team of marine landscape gardeners. This bright green plant stretches its silken tendrils in long horizontal sways between pillars of the east reef. This plant is characterized by its fibrous, fine and flexible strands that can be as thick as rope and as thin as human hair, appearing almost white in sunlight. How they form their bridges and why the plant stand beans do not rise the surface is unclear. I've observed one plant intermarrying with strands from other pillars, and when these multiple strands meet, often the flower is fluffy. At, at distance from the respective pillars, they seem to form a web. I wonder if strands from individual plants are drawn to one another. Analysis of the strand of sea silk has shown that it is in fact from two different plants that have somehow conjoined where they met. Moreover, there are younger growths formed near to the end of each plant's strand, demonstrating their ability to form new shoots along their land which must be why I observe a web-like pattern in some of the tangles. However, new growths require a good deal of energy. The strands are green on one side, a sign of photosynthesis no doubt, but their underside is distinctly darker and more porous looking. Are the strands able to absorb matter floating up from underneath them? I need to analyze a root structure or similar to find out more. I was surprised to discover that the sea silk does not end in roots. After finding a damaged turn, I found it emanating from a kind of silken ball that I initially took to be a root. However, in lab analysis, it was revealed to be an entirely separate creature, 
The sea silk is a product of plant like limb of this organism. I discovered the root itself to be able to put down, but also retract strands of sea silk from within. It's an unusual fusion of creatures. Is this a symbiotic relation or a parasitic one? Regardless, those cre these creatures pre curious creatures and their dwellers are the bridge builders of the pure ecosystem, turning isolated gardens into a connected network and helping them flourish. Where I'm able to be because I hope I don't have enough space. What I'm going to do is cross the past current. Faster, yeah. Uh, Just this. Uh, uh, There's just one sample that I need. But I'll shoot. Please take me back on the ship. of a shimmer bloom shoe has revealed a cold stalk which each shimmer bloom possesses, allowing them to control their height in the water. This means that if a shimmer bloom grows beyond the optimum depth of photosynthesis, it is able to extend its stalk and rise in the water toward the surface. However, due to the constant sunlight, which is an effect of at least 67 cc steadily locked orbit, shimmer bloom also uses this ability to retract themselves away from the sun in order to protect themselves from cell damage. These beautiful plants are highly attuned to their environment, and I can think of no better species to give Mimea's name to. It is a name that deserves to live on, on in this place. I'm sorry I can't do more. She's not dead. Is she? I really want to sing stop tissue. Exposed or damaged sink stops. Hmm. Let's try it. Okay, I think I'll remember. I think I remember. Okay. I know which one. We have it on the map since nearly the beginning. Yeah. 
They say with no equipment. These huge songs have been worn smooth by thousands of years of sitting beside the river. White sand has gathered against the boulders on either side of its passage in soft, pale drifts. This tall stalk is torn open, wrapped by a predator, inside a rich tapestry of fungal life forms exposed to the open water, slowly dying. This is our final sample. Fungal cluster. To analyze the interior of a sink stock reveals many different organisms within the stock which are not genetically related to it in any way. It seems that the sink stocks are actually tub tubular gardens which hold juvenile fungal creatures. The swelling of the stocks keep these sealed environments fed with filtered water and microbial life, while allowing their spores to be distributed across the reef. However, I haven't found a single example of any of these life forms growing outside of a single stock. Suggesting that they can only survive within these carefully controlled tube gardens and that the spores they raise are being used by the stocks for other purposes. Are these vertical forms designed to cultivate other species that might feed the rest of the stocks with shower of nutrients rich spores? Most of most we've cleared all of the things we are able to collect with all the samples. And let's go across one. The northern reef is the largest of the cuts into the central reef. Crossing it without some way of navigating the place would be suicide. Impressive! This place in the shelf is incredibly wide and deep. Okay, well, here goes nothing. Start up the propulsion system and let's cross. of spores and other organic material rip past in the current track into the dense stock patches in the west. This massive split in the ocean seems almost too violent to be natural. Both sides are almost impossible to see from the center point. Spill rising up in the ocean floor deep below provides shelter from the rift. There's something on the other side, a huge green cloud rising up from the shelf. Less dramatically than the central reef. Oh, that must be the moon. Less dramatically shorter than the central reef, the northern shelf slopes down gently through lines of sediment.
The green wall of a vast room of some kind rises up ahead, swirling and obscure. What ecological crisis spawned this green mass? How is it connected to the reef? If the answers are anywhere, they are inside. The water inside is totally anoxic. The suits for really can't function. We have to run on reserve oxygen while we are inside this place. Bubbles and shiny these formations sit under a coating of green filaments and groves. The water here is both highly oxygenated and temporarily filtered of its toxin and microbes by the fire. Just life, still hanging on inside this toxic bloom, creating safe zone in order to, um, to thrive. Perhaps these creatures can help us learn how to exist in these toxic conditions. Let's take some samples and see what effects they have on the bloom when we deploy them. These pale, delicate fans are almost all white against the clouded green of the bloom. These fans seem to be re-oxygenating the water. I'll start logging notes, they should be useful. Occasionally, this foul shiver is releasing a fear of pink groves that have gathered among its grossa marks, right? This fine sits among shards of rock, trembling in the cyclical currents of the bloom. Doesn't seem to be doing anything. A rise of silver silt fills the depression created by the corroded rock shell. A deep over shell pokes above it. Is that a lie? This bronze shell sits half buried in the sun. The creature lives inside it. And how can we attempt to die? There's some kind of shelled creature hiding in the silt over there. We need to figure out how to tempt it out of this barrel. Perhaps something from elsewhere in the bloom, something to rest with the global growth itself. Here, the rocky shelf the leaf flakes away into large feather sheets for failing sharp edges. Among the green, I see tiny blue flashes occasionally flickering. Old has gathered around the base of this white outcrop and a symmetrical welcome to it within a competitive The thin streak of oxygen to water behind the function is paint to chase catalytic dust. The bloom is vast. What could cause and sustain this process on such a scale? With the oxygen gone, the microbes here must be metabolizing some other substance in order to persist. These creatures bury themselves to hide from the bloom's toxicity, making them one of the few lifeforms that can survive the bloom. These fans have to be filtering the water the bloom of the bloom to feed. Behind each one is a small area of clear oxygenated water. Eaten away by the bloom, this outcrop is marked with a patina of tiny holes. Anchored to the flaking rock, it is found to be softly dislodging from the pink bowl as it does.
There is a faint fizzling that emerges from these flowers. It appears to be caused by the coating of their spines, red and the blue. The currents of the bloom grow stronger as they move away from the rocky outcrops of its southern side. A low sill drift provides just enough cover for a pile of uh, shell which picks out from beneath the pale of the sand. which can fall down and simply sort of retract full eyes and other the creatures to quickly consume them and gain its shell and start of eating. Green clouds shrink above the rock floor, honeycomb with holes. A refractive glow casts the shattered ground in full light. This Head a fizzling made of oxygenated water. Within the protective barrier, the water is oxygenated and clear of microbial clouds. What chemical process is being enacted here? Is this what allows the species here to survive this constant toxicity? Within these complex transparent structures, the blood activity of many individual creatures can be seen. These must be nests. These swarms of bright creatures provide a vital safe zone in the moon. Let's start logging data on them. With the, within the open structure of these nests, swarms of glinting particles form shifting shapes. This colony is the well to hold out against the bloom. The individual creatures seem to be able to digest the microbial growth. We can use this. We should try deploying a colony to see if we can create our own safe zone inside this toxic blood. All the domes and poor spheres of these skeletons gleam with the beauty of their silica blades. These strange forms scattered around inside the bubble are these skeletons? They resemble radiola radiolarians, but, but far bigger in scale, they are incredibly ornate. A colony of shattered domes lying in the silvery sealed. What were these creatures? Strange fizzling light provides a little comfort in this busy wasteland. Nothing but the green water and broken rock. The shapes of corrupted outcrops sit in the west like sleeping giants. Go back. We need to replenish our oxygen uh, and we need to bring more oxygen with us. We can't. We need to get back on our own. I don't know if we are able. A small construction drawn from the base, corroded beyond use. What was we doing about here? Okay. That is the place we're gonna end this part. Now, thank you very much. Stay alive. I'll try who. And see you later. Bye!